Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on our Title Tuesday. I'd like to go over a few ground rules before we have our guest speaker come on. Um, all questions are to be entered into the chat and questions will be asked at the, uh, during the presentation on your behalf, please. Uh, please make sure your device is muted. If your question is not asked or answered, you will be given the speaker's contact info so you can contact them directly. I'd like to thank all of our PCT reps for joining us today, as well as inviting all of their clients. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Um, I'd also, um, I would also like to remind everybody about our Title Tuesday next week. We've got uh, our very own Jorge Mesa as our guest speaker. Jorge is going to be uh, discussing on how to create and manage an ideal farm dur during COVID-19. That's next Tuesday, July 28th at 1 p.m. We also have um, our following Tuesday already set. We've got Rudy Cortez, Pacific Coast Title Senior Underwriter. He's going to be discussing title insurance from an underwriter's perspective. That should be really interesting and good uh, for everybody to learn. Um, I'd like to introduce our rep, Eddie Castro, who's going to go ahead and introduce our guest speaker today. Hi, everyone. I'm Eddie Castro with Pacific Coast Title Los Angeles. I'd like to introduce Paul D. Velasco, founder of Velasco Law Group, APC. Paul has been practicing law for more than 22 years and focusing his practice exclusively on estate planning, probate and trust administration, as well as probate and trust litigation. He's a certified specialist in estate planning, trust and probate law, and lectures extensively on trust and estate planning matters for wealth management advisors, corporate trustees, real estate professionals, and professional groups. Paul and his firm have represented Farmers and Merchants Trust Company of Long Beach, Wells Fargo, Wells Fargo Bank NA, Union Bank, and other professional trustees as legal counsel on various trust, probate, and litigation matters. Without further ado, here's Paul Velasco. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. It's good to be with you all. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Jorge Mesa for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. I, I always enjoy really the opportunity to speak with, with uh, real estate professionals. A big part of my practice is representing trustees and executors when they have to administer an estate. When somebody passes away, there are things that have to be done, obviously, uh, for the estate, for the beneficiaries. And so we represent trustees and executors in carrying out those duties. We make sure that they do their job, uh, that they carry out the wishes of the people who made the trust or the will. And as a part of that, almost every single estate plan, when somebody passes away in almost every single estate, there is a real property of some kind. So we have to work. I mean, I speak with real estate agents really on a daily basis because uh, we're, we're involved in at least 50 to 60 cases at any given time in our office where somebody's passed away and those properties are constantly being, being sold. So we're often having to deal uh, very closely with the real estate professionals to make sure that the real estate gets sold and that everything's done properly. So I enjoyed the opportunity to speak with you and I'm gonna to talk to you today. I'm gonna to tailor my presentation really to you, to your profession. Uh, I'm gonna talk, obviously give you some, just some basics about estate planning, the importance of it, why you do it. And then from there, I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the most common mistakes and problems that I deal with on really on a daily basis. Most of the work I do here, most of the stuff I do uh, is trust and estate related litigation. So even though I'm an estate planning attorney and really that's my core practice, uh, most of the time I'm in court having to deal with situations where there's problems. You know, beneficiaries fighting amongst each other, people challenging the trust. Uh, often there are trustees who are not doing their job, who are mismanaging the trust assets when someone dies. They're sometimes misappropriating assets. They're not communicating with the beneficiaries. And so many times these estates end up in court. And even though when somebody did a will or a trust, the intent was to try to keep it out of court because of the problems that were done. And many of the times, unfortunately, problems are made by the people who make the trust. Sometimes the attorneys who make mistakes. Often though, it's paralegals. When people go to paralegals to try and do their estate plan or they try legal Zoom and they try and do it themselves. And you know, unfortunately, people think that they're saving money by, by doing that. And the reality is, that in the end of the day, when somebody passes away and those documents are not done correctly, uh, we now have to go to court to fix them, if they can be fixed at all. And now because if you, 
many of the documents are are not in, you can't interpret them because they're they're ambiguous. They don't state clearly what was intended. And if you interpret it one way, it helps one side of the family. If you interpret it another way, it may help some other beneficiaries. And so now there's a dispute. And the only way to resolve that is in court. And now the families are going to be spending not thousands, but tens of thousands of dollars dealing with these issues. So my goal today is to talk to you about a little bit about those kinds of things that I deal with in hopes that you, you, guys, you can avoid them for your clients and for your families. All right. So this is what I do. I'm, I'm a certified specialist in estate planning, probate, and trust law. So estate planning, I'm going to give you just some basics. Why do we do it? What's the most important thing? Why is it that you, you need a trust or a will? Well, the first thing, of course, the main goal of doing estate planning is so that you get to say where your property goes when you pass away. The reality is most people don't do that. Most people don't do a will or a trust. And so most people die what's called intestate, meaning having not done a will or a trust. Well, what you may not know is that every single one of you, whether you've done a will or not, whether you've done your own estate plan or not, every single one of you has a will. Everybody in California, California has a will. Either you've done it yourself or the state of California has done it for you. So when you pass away, if you haven't said where your property goes, the state of California is gonna do that. It's gonna to go to your heirs. It may or may not go to the people that you would have wanted, but why would you leave that up to the state to do that? You should decide where that goes. And the only way you can do it is by having an estate plan in place. So that's the first goal. The other goal is to make sure that the people who you leave it to, that they receive it in the appropriate way, in an appropriate manner. If you pass away and you have young children or you have grandchildren that you're leaving gifts to, you don't want to leave it to them so that they receive it all at, at the age of 18. Because in California, that's the age of majority. If somebody passes away and they receive an inheritance, if they reach the age of 18, they have complete control of those assets. Now, I don't know if you've seen an 18 year old with a bunch of assets or money in their hands, but you can guess what's gonna happen. It does not last long, unfortunately. You know, their immaturity, irresponsibility, uh, often family members and so-called friends come around because they know they have money and now there's giving loans to people. And before you know it, that money is just gone. So there's a better way to do that. If you have a trust, you can set things up for your children and grandchildren so that if something were to happen to you unexpectedly and they're still young, it can be set up so that somebody else is in control of it for them until they reach an appropriate age. So that's the kind of thing you can do with a trust. If you don't have anything, 18 is the age at which they would get it if you pass away. All right, the other goal of estate planning, the other thing you wanna do is you wanna make sure that you choose the right person to have control of your assets when you're gone. So you have to choose an executor or a successor trustee who's gonna now carry out your wishes and instructions. And that's, I'm gonna tell you, it's the second most important decision you will make in your estate plan. The first, of course, being where your property is gonna go, but the second is who's gonna be in control of things when you're gone. A big part of our practice is trust and estate related litigation. That means that we're going after trustees and executors, as I mentioned earlier, they're not doing their job. They're, they're not, administering the state, the estate, they're procrastinating, they're not selling the property, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing in order to eventually distribute everything to the beneficiaries. So we get calls from beneficiaries saying, hey, my brother's the trustee of the trust, you know, my parents died a year ago, two years ago, and he doesn't give us any information. He's living in the house, and what can we do? So now we end up having to get involved and deal with all those things. So it's important that you choose the right person who you think, who you know, is going to follow through with your wishes. Somebody who's responsible, somebody who has common sense, somebody who communicates well with others. These are the kinds of people that you want in there. And if you don't do that, if you don't do anything, often when you pass away, it's a fight among your family members as to who gets to be in control of things. So that's an important reason to set up an estate plan is you get to decide who is going to be in control. The other reason you do an estate plan is to maximize the amount that we're passing to your family ultimately. Because if you do an estate plan and everything is in order when you pass away, there's going to be very little costs. There's going to be uh, minimal attorney's fees. There's going to be no court costs. So we don't have to go through that cost and expense and time of court. So setting up an estate plan minimizes all of those costs and expenses and maximizes the amount that you can get to your family. So that's why we're doing estate planning, right? So, what is it that you can do? What kind of estate planning tools are there for somebody to do an estate plan? Well, 
One of the things that people use that you really may not consider as an estate planning tool, but I will tell you, people use it that way, is joint tenancy. Uh, you're all familiar with joint tenancy and what that means. But joint tenancy, as you all know, is a manner of taking title to something. You can take title to real estate as joint tenants. You can take title to bank accounts, investments. And of course, the most common and important feature of a joint tenancy is the right of survivorship. And that's why people use it as an estate planning tool. So instead of doing a will or a trust, they say, well, I'm just going to add my child or my children to the title of my property. And that way, if I pass away, it'll go to them automatically by joint tenancy. So people have that in mind. Uh, husbands and wives, when they buy property together, uh, the most common way, as you probably know, that the way they take title today is still joint tenancy. I'm going to tell you, joint tenancy is the worst way to take title to anything. The worst way. I'm going to tell you now uh, all the reasons why. And I'm going to tell you in the context of cases that I dealt with because of joint tenancy. Okay, so here's the first case. So I had a, a woman who came to me a couple years ago. Uh, her husband had just recently passed away. He passed away and she was not in great health either. She had two young children and so she wanted to ensure that the property would go to them without having to go through a probate. So she talked to a paralegal and a paralegal told her, yeah, you just add them to the title of the property as, as a joint owner and they will have now, uh, if something happens to you, automatically the property will go to them. No need for a will, you're going to go through probate, just automatically by right of survival, they'll get the property. So that's what she did. She added her two children. She filed, she recorded a quick claim deed, adding them to the title. And then about a year after that, one of her children got into a motorcycle accident. And unfortunately, it's a very tragic situation, but he was left in a vegetative state. So he could no longer manage his own affairs. And so what happened was she wanted to later then sell the property or, or refinance it. And she, of course, as you know, she's not gonna be able to do that because her children are on title. And this one son is not gonna be able to sign anymore anything back over to her. So what do you have to do in that situation? Well, we had to establish a conservatorship for her son. A conservatorship is a proceeding where somebody is appointed to take control of your finances and to sign for you in the event that you become incapacitated. And that's what happened here. So even though she didn't really intend to give her children the property during her lifetime, when you add somebody to the title, that's exactly what you're doing. That, joint, that deed doesn't take effect only at death. It's effective immediately when you add somebody to the title. And now because he was on there, she would not be able to sell it without his his permission or signing it back over. So we had to establish a conservatorship. The property then got sold and one third of those proceeds ended up in the conservatorship where it's now controlled by her, but under the auspices of the court. So you can see that this is just one problem that can happen. Let me explain another one. So I had another client who had called me and she called me in a panic from one day to the next money in her bank account had been drained. It was just all gone. She had over $120,000 in the account and she didn't know what happened. She thought she was a victim of fraud. So she called the bank and then immediately called us. And what we ended up finding out was that she had added her son as an owner, a joint owner on the account because she wanted him to have access. If something happened to her, he wanted her, he, she wanted him to have access to the account to be able to pay bills and things. So it's a common thing. Uh, well, he didn't take the money, but what happened was he had a judgment in his name. Somebody had sued him some years ago, obtained a judgment against him, and then they found this account with his name on it. Now, we don't know, we still don't know to this day how they found it because he was, uh, it was not his social security number that was used, but they did find it and they levied against it. Now, normally when a creditor levies against an account, the bank has to notify the, my client, would have had to notify my client. The bank claims they did, they, they showed a copy of the notice, but she never got it. So now the, the bank levies on the account, the creditor gets the money. So we ended up getting involved. We got most of that money back for her. So we had to go to pay uh, the creditor a little bit of money and then she had to pay me my fees. So, so this, and, and by the way, if she had added her son to the title, fortunately she didn't do this, but if she had added him to the title of her property, the same thing would have happened. That judgment lien would have attached to her property. Another situation where a client of mine's, her, her daughter is now going through a divorce. She had added her daughter to the title of her house. Uh, her daughter's now going through a divorce and that property is now getting pulled into the divorce. So you can see here a common theme. What happens is when you add people to the title of your property, 
their problems are going to be your problems now. So it's important to understand that these things don't take effect just at death. They're effective immediately. And I can't tell you in my 22 year career, how many times I've had to deal with situations like this, where a client has added their children to the title of their property, they've added them as joint owners. And now there's a falling out with that child or one of those children. And the parents want to call that property back. And of course, when you reach out to the child to ask them to sign a deed to put it back in mom or dad's name, uh, nobody's going to listen to that. And so unfortunately, now we end up in a situation where either you've got to just let the child have the property, or you got to sue your own child to get your property back. Uh, many, many situations like that that have happened. So let me tell you one more. There are many of these, by the way, but let me just tell you one more in the context of husbands and wives owning property as joint tenancy and what the problem can be with that. So before I tell you the case that I dealt with, uh, and, I, and I deal with many of these types of cases, but let me tell you, just give you some context uh, about what I'm talking about. So uh, if you see on the bottom of the screen there where I say the problem with joint tenancy, it says the capital gains tax problem. So here's the thing. When you buy a property, so let's say I buy a property and I pay $200,000 for that property. Okay? Obviously, it's not in California, but let's say I pay $200,000 for a property. And now I'm going to sell it some years later for $500,000, right? I'm going to pay a capital gains tax. And the tax is going to be based on the difference between what I paid for it, which is called my basis, and what I sold it for. That's my gain, right? So capital gains and the, the concept of basis is important. What did you pay for the property? Because that's your starting point for determining capital gains in the future when you sell the property. But what if I don't sell it? What if instead I, I gift it or I, at my death, I, I transfer it to, through my trust to my daughter? So now my daughter owns this property. I pass away, I've never sold the property, I paid 200,000 for it, it's now fi worth 500,000 at my death, but I never sold it. I pass it to her at my death through my trust, and now she has the property. What is the basis of the property in her hands if she goes to sell it? As you may know, it's a stepped up basis. So the basis is now the date of death value. So whatever, she, whatever the value is of the property at the time of my death, that is now her basis going forward. If she sells the property the next day, zero gain. So where I may have had a problem paying capital gains tax if I had sold it, now because of my death and getting a stepped up basis in her hands, she has no capital gains tax problem. So a stepped up basis at death is an important concept, right? All right, now let's talk about husbands and wives. So the Internal Revenue Code, the IRS, gives husbands and wives in community property estates a benefit that when the first spouse dies, if it's community property, the entire property gets a full stepped up basis at death, the entire thing. So that's a huge benefit. So one spouse passes away, the survivor wants to sell the property at the spouse's death, they get to sell it with zero capital gains taxes if they can show that it's community property. So here's the problem now. So a client came to me and she was referred by her accountant, her CPA, because she was gonna sell the property. And she, this is a property that she and her husband bought more than 50 years ago in Rancho Palos Verdes. Uh, she had paid several, they paid several hundred thousand dollars for the property, was now worth several million dollars. And so he had passed away about a year before she came to me and she wanted to know she was gonna sell the property and go move in with her daughter. And she wanted to know if she was gonna pay capital gains tax when she sold it. So I said, well, it depends. I'd have to take a look at the title. So I pulled the, the, the title and of course the title read that they acquired the property, husband and wife, as joint tenants. Unfortunately, the IRS does not recognize joint tenancy as community property, even though under California law it is, but this, the federal government is not bound by state law. They don't really care what, what the state of California says. They're saying, hey, prove to us that this is community property. Show us in writing somewhere that this is community property, because if it's joint tenancy, we don't recognize that. And so only his half, of the property got stepped up, her half remained the same, that purchase price that they purchased it at 50 years ago. So unfortunately, because of the way that she held title, she had to pay several hundred thousand dollars in capital gains taxes when she sold the property. If it had been held as community property, zero gain. So that's the problem as you can see with joint tenancy. There's, there's a number of others, but I don't have time to go through everything. But you can see now the problem with joint tenancy. Now, I'm not saying this is that you can now go tell everybody when they're asking you how to take the title 
that you go tell them, oh, don't take title as joint tenants, you gotta take title as community property. Obviously, I think you know that. Uh, that's not your job. It's something that could get you into trouble and, I, and I've had to deal with that situation before where uh, real estate agents or other professionals have gotten themselves in trouble by telling people how to title things. That's not up to you because we don't know whether or not this is gonna be community property. What if somebody is using their, their inheritance to buy the property and then it's, it's not community property, it's separate property. So those issues you, you, you're not really gonna tell them about. But what you do now recognize is that there's a problem. If somebody's telling you they wanna take title as joint tenants, it tells you a couple of things. Number one, they don't have a trust and they should have a trust. If they have real estate, they need to have a trust. And number two, you now can see that there are problems with joint tenancy and there may be a better way to take title is all you have to tell them. Tell them they should speak with an attorney or somebody who can advise them about a better way. So that's all you've got to do. All right. Paul, so, this is Anthony. We've got a, a couple of questions before yeah. you move on uh, on the board. Um, first question is, can you review an existing trust and update it to make changes? I'm assuming they're asking if you're not the original attorney who created Yes, it. yes, of course. Yeah, so you know, any, any attorney who knows what they're doing or who has specialty in this area would be able to review another trust and then advise clients or make changes or make amendments, yeah. And then I've got, an, we have another question uh, before we move on. Um, it says from Patricia, I have a client whose father died. It's a scenario, by the way, Paul, so. I have a client whose father died in 1988. One of the daughters by way of his wife, both now deceased, forced her name on title. My client need, needed a litigation attorney on the deceased daughter's probate estate. Can you help with something like that? Sure, we can help. Yeah, just give us a call. Be happy to answer questions and give advice and uh, help, help out in the situation if possible. Great, okay. okay. Good, Paul, thank you. All right. Okay, so now we've talked about joint tenancy and why that's not a good option. Let me talk now a little bit about the second option you see there, which is a will. Everybody knows what a will is, right? A will is simply a document that states where you want your property to go when you pass away. In a will, you not only state who your beneficiaries are gonna be, but you also name an executor, the person who's gonna have control of things uh, and be able to carry out the administration of your estate. So a will is better than nothing because at least the will says where you want your property to go. And we don't have to rely on the, on the law of the state of California to decide where it goes by intestacy. In a will, you get to pick your beneficiaries. The problem, however, with the will is that all wills are subject to probate. So there's a misconception out there thinking that if I have a will, I don't have to go through probate. No, a will is gonna guarantee that you're gonna go through probate. Wills have to be probated. A will, the, to, the word probate means, in the Latin means to prove. So the will has to be proven to be valid, that it was signed with all the requisite formalities and that it's a valid document. So that's done in probate court. So a will is gonna be probated. So what are the problems with probate? Why are we trying to avoid it? Because look, at its core, probate is actually serves a good purpose. The purpose behind probate is to ensure that when somebody dies, their final affairs are settled, all their debts, taxes, and expenses are paid, and then the property, whatever's there, gets to the right people. Those are good things, those are good goals. But probate in California is the most time-consuming, inconvenient, costly way to do it. So these are the problems with probate. Number one, there's no privacy. In a probate, anybody can go down to the courthouse, literally pull your file and see what you had, what you owned. All your property and assets are listed there. The names and addresses of all your beneficiaries and who's getting what is all there. So all of these, this information is there and people use that, people glean that information and sometimes they use it to take advantage of beneficiaries. So it's important to avoid probate if we can for that reason, no privacy. You know all those, those news magazine shows where they talk to you about all these celebrities and these, their divorces and the, their conservatorships and Britney Spears and all of that. All of that information is gleaned from the court files. It's all there for everybody to read. So, Nobody wants to air their dirty laundry in public, so to speak, but that's what happens in a probate. So that's one reason you want to avoid it. It's, it's uh, no privacy. The second reason is this. I mean, what do, what do people do in court? People fight. It's a place where disputes are, are had and settled, uh, where trials take place. All of that, probate court is no different. The same thing happens there. People are fighting over the, over the will, over the estate. Uh, people are going after the executor. People are filing claims against the estate. 
Medi-Cal can make a claim against your state if it's in a probate. Um, they can't do that if it's in a trust, but they can if it's in a probate situation. They can file, and usually those Medi-Cal claims are very large and sometimes eat up the entire estate. So all of this stuff happens in probate. So another reason to avoid it. The other thing is time delays. It takes now about a year and a half, 15 to 18 months to go through a probate if there are no issues. There's no litigation, no problems. It takes about 15 to 18 months, especially with COVID and the delays that have come in now. It used to be where I could file a petition for probate and get a hearing date that's about six to eight weeks out. Now it's six months before I get the first hearing date on a probate. So it's just really not a good situation right now. And so time delays are another reason to avoid probate. And your family doesn't get anything until the end of the probate. So if they're waiting, you know, a year, two years, that's not a good thing. It can create hardships financially for them. The other thing is that probate is expensive. It's extremely expensive. Pro the probate fees are based on the size of the estate. In the probate code, there's a sliding scale that's used to determine what the probate fees are. I'll give you an example. So using that sliding scale, if you had, let's just go to the top there, $500,000 estate. If you own a, a property in California and it's going through probate, these are the fees. You pay $13,000 to the attorney, $13,000 to the executor. That's why it's multiplied by two. So $26,000 in executor's fees and attorney's fees. And then there's about $4,000 in filing fees and court costs. So about $30,000 just to probate a house. And by the way, if that house had a mortgage on it, let's say that that $500,000 house had a $200,000 mortgage against it, for purposes of calculating the fees, you don't reduce the, reduce the value by the mortgage. So it stays at that $500,000 value, even though the gross value of that property is only 300,000, the fees for the attorney and the executor are based on the gross value of the estate. And you can see as you go along, it's, it gets more and more expensive. And, and by the way, this is just for an ordinary probate. If you're fighting, if you're going through litigation, if you're having if people make claims against the estate and the attorney has to defend all of that, the attorney gets to charge additional fees called extraordinary fees for those services as well. So it gets expensive. I'm telling you, there was a, a couple of years ago, I, I was involved in, a, in an estate that was $300,000. My statutory fee, according to the code, was $7,000 based on that. But my extraordinary fee was $32,000, $40,000 to probate a $300,000 estate. It was bad, it, but this is how it is in probate. So this is why we want to avoid it, okay? All the fees. So how do we do that? How do we avoid probate? You have a living trust. So a living trust is a will substitute. It does the same thing that a will does. It allows you in your trust to name the people who, you're gonna, who are gonna inherit from you. So this trust at its core is really just a contract. It's a contract. So there are three key positions in every single trust. Creator, often referred to as the settlor, the grantor, it's the maker of the trust. The trustee, that's the person who has all the power and authority to transact on the trust, the power to sell property, the power to distribute the property, the power to invest the property. The trustee has all the power. And the third is the beneficiary. That's the prop person to whom these assets of the trust belong. So let's say that I'm going to create the Paul Velasco Trust. So what I do is I actually create this document, this trust document, this contract, and now I'm going to occupy all three positions. I'm the creator, I'm the trustee because I still want to be in control of my property, and I'm the beneficiary because these are still my assets. I haven't given them away yet to anybody. They're still mine. So what I do, think of a trust as a box. I'm creating this Paul Velasco box, okay? Now, it's not enough just for me to sign the document and put it away and do nothing else because then the box is empty. There's nothing in it. What you have to do with a trust and what most people make a mistake on is funding the trust. Once you create it, you have to put your property into it. And you do that by recording deeds for real estate to put your property from you, my name, the Paul Velasco, to the Paul Velasco Trust. My bank accounts will now be titled in the name of the trust. My investments, my stocks, my company, my corporation will be titled in the name of the trust. My life insurance, I've named the trust as the beneficiary. All of these things, so now I'm putting everything into this box. So now this box is filled with my stuff. And during my lifetime, I'm not gonna notice a difference in the way that I deal with my property or pay taxes. Nothing really changes. 
The only thing that's changed is that the property is not in my individual name anymore. It's in the name of my trust. And the difference is that when somebody dies with property in their name, it's subject to probate. So this is why we create a trust. We take it out of my name and we put it into the trust. In the trust, we avoid probate. That, that, that trust document now has uh, all the power and authority that my successor trustee needs. So in, initially when I create the trust, I'm the trustee, but I'm gonna name in the trust when I create it, a successor trustee. In fact, I'm gonna name at least maybe two or three people in an order of priority so that if something happens in my first choice, I have a second choice and a third choice. But my, that successor trustee is now gonna have all the power and authority. That trust document that I've created gives them all the power and authority they need to get control of my bank accounts, my investments. They record deeds that give them control over my real estate. They can take that trust to the bank and get control of my accounts. They can collect my life insurance money with that trust. So all of these things are controlled by the trust now and we don't have to go to probate. We don't need a court or authority from the court to do that. Everything is done with that trust document, okay? So that's the difference between a will and a trust. So what are the main differences? Right here. Number one, a trust avoids probate. No probate if you have a trust and it's done correctly, okay? Number two, it avoids a conservatorship. If I became incapacitated at some point, let's say I didn't pass away, but I had an accident that I'm in the hospital for a few months and I can't manage my own affairs, my successor trustee can step in and now manage things. He can pay my bills and maintain my property and do whatever needs to get done to continue to provide for me. So it avoids having to go to court to do that with a conservatorship. A trust avoids Medi-Cal claims. If I, during my lifetime, receive Medi-Cal benefits, uh, if I go into a nursing home and I receive benefits uh, and then I pass away, if my assets are in a trust, Medi-Cal cannot make a claim against that trust. If instead I didn't do a trust and now my estate's going through probate, it's gonna, Medi-Cal can make their recovery claim there. And as I mentioned, sometimes it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. So avoiding Medi-Cal claims is really important. The other thing is that a trust will limit creditors' claims because uh, remember, in a, in a court situation, anybody can come and make claims against the estate because you have to let everybody know. You have to let all your creditors know that you're going through a probate. You have to notify uh, bank account or your, your bank cards, your credit card companies. You need to notify hospitals or anybody that's owed money has to be notified of this probate and then they get to make a claim in the estate. All right. All right. And then the last thing, of course, is that with a trust, there's privacy. We don't go through court, so nobody gets to see what all your assets are. When there's a trust administration and somebody dies, the only people who get to see the trust are the beneficiaries and the trustee. That's it. The public doesn't get to see that. They don't get to see who's getting what. They don't get to see what your assets are. All of that is done in a private proceeding. Okay. That is a living trust. All right, Paul, we have a couple questions here. Sure. Uh, First one is from Veronica Jones. I have a client bought a duplex 20 years ago whose husband passed away two years ago, joint tenants. They have it in a trust and want uh, to will it to their two kids. Will there be capital gains? Well, no. So if it's in, if the property's in the trust, so if the property's in the trust and then the, and then the, the second spouse passes away and it goes to the children, there will be a stepped up basis, remember? So that basis gets stepped up for the property to the date of death value. Now, if they sell it not long after they pass away, no, there's not gonna be any capital gains. Perfect, and the next one is from Maureen. Uh, two sisters inherited apartment from their father. They are married, but wanna keep the apartment separate from their spouse. Should the apartment have its own trust? Yes, if they, if they inherited property and they wanna keep it separate, you can in a joint, in a family trust, in a joint trust, have also separate property. We do it by putting schedules in the trust that say, hey, this is our community property and we list all the community property assets and this is my separate property. You can do that, but often my recommendation is to do a separate trust for that separate property. And that way, when you wanna make changes to it or do anything, your, your other spouse doesn't have to sign. It's just your separate property trust with only your assets. So yeah, it's, you can do a separate property trust. And the next one is from Linda Smith. Uh, do you need a special needs trust or a mental challenge uh, adult or a life estate to ensure they have a house to live in? Yeah, that's a great question. And yes, yes. So that's another reason to do estate planning is you want to make sure 
Remember I said that one of the goals is to make sure that your beneficiaries receive it in the right way. Well, we talked about age before, getting it at the right time, but also for beneficiaries who are receiving government benefits, Medi-Cal, SSI, disability. If people are receiving benefits, what, what a lot of people don't realize is that if you pass away and your property, your, your children who are receiving, your special needs child is receiving government benefits, uh, and they may be disqualified now because now they have assets when they, that they've inherited from you. And so they now may be disqualified from receiving those benefits, which are very important. So there's a way that you can still allow them to receive their government benefits, still qualify, but also leave them an inheritance. And you do that by including what are called special needs trust provisions in your trust. So that child will not get a direct inheritance. It will never go into their name because then they're going to be disqualified. Instead, it'll go into a special trust for whatever they need over and above what they get from the government, and a trustee can manage that for them. So they'll never be in control of it, but it'll be there for their benefit, and they won't be disqualified from government benefits. So you have to set that up in a trust. Sounds good. Thanks, Mark. All right. All right. So let's talk about now, uh, you guys, I think, have a, a good basic understanding of, of the importance now of estate planning, the importance of doing a trust rather than just a will, uh, the importance of making sure that it gets done right so things, mistakes don't happen. But what, what, what the old adage that, you know, what you don't know can't hurt you is really not true when it comes to estate planning because what you don't know can and will hurt you. There are very often a common theme, problems and issues and mistakes that people make that I deal with on a daily basis. So let me talk about what are some of those mistakes that people make when it comes to their estate planning and how we can avoid that. So the first one is this. Number one, how does your estate end up in probate court even if you have a living trust? Remember I said a living trust, the whole purpose of it is to avoid probate, right? That's the main purpose of a living trust is to avoid probate. So how is it then that if I have a trust, my estate may go through probate anyway? And I can tell you that it, Many, many times uh, in any given month or year, I have to deal with those situations where somebody came in, their parents have passed away, they bring in their family trust, and they say, you know, we want you to help us administer the trust, but then we find out that the property is not titled in the name of the trust. It's in their individual name. So remember I said that that box being empty is a problem? So if you see on the last thing here, this note, the trust is effective only for assets held in the name of the trust. If when you pass away, you don't have your assets in the trust and there was something that was inadvertently left out of the trust, well, that's not part of the trust. And how do you get it in there then when somebody dies? If somebody dies with property in their name and they had a trust, how do you get it into the trust when they die? The way you do that is with a will. So in every estate plan that I do, in addition to doing the, the trust, which is the main document for my clients, we also do a will for them. But a will in this context is only a backup document, right? The will doesn't need to say where everything goes when, when you pass away, because the trust already says that. The will is only a backup document that says, when I die, if I inadvertently leave something out of the trust, if there is something that I left in my name only, then at my death, I leave it all to my trust. So the will just simply leaves it all to the trust, right? That's the, the idea. You catch something that was left out and you get it into the trust. But what's the problem with relying on the will to do that? The will gets probated. And so even though you have a trust, that property was not in the trust, you have to use a will to get it in there. You got to go to probate first. And then after the probate, that property gets distributed into the trust. So, I mean, the whole purpose of doing the trust or one of the main purposes was to avoid probate. But a trust in order to be worked properly has to be funded. You have to keep your assets in the trust. And if you don't do that, it's going to be in probate, all right? But there is a way to avoid this. There's a way to avoid this. So that's the good news. Now, in the 22 years I've been doing this, even though I had situations like I just mentioned to you where clients made mistakes, right? We helped them initially to put everything in their trust. But then later in life, as they go through life, they acquire new things. They open up new bank accounts. They start a business. They buy a property. And often they forget to take title in the name of the trust. So what do they do? They put it in their name like they always did. Now they pass away. And yes, there are some things that are in the trust, but there are other things that are not. So how do we get that in there? 
Well, if all you have is the will, you're going to go through probate, but we don't do that. We rely on this case called the estate of Hegstead. This is a case that was happened in court back in 1993. So let me give you the facts of the case. What happened was this, a gentleman by the name of Hegstead did his trust. He formed his trust and he put most of his properties into the trust and, and his other assets, but there was one property that he inadvertently left out. He thought it was a partnership, but it was actually a, a, a property, a title property. So he ended up having to, uh, when he passed away, he didn't change the title on that property to his trust. So now when he died, they were going to have to do what you normally do, use his will to do a probate and then get it into the trust. But instead, the attorney for the estate at the time made a new argument, made a novel argument. Instead of filing a petition in the probate court to probate the will, he filed a petition in the trust court. And he asked the court in, in that case to recognize Mr. Hegstead's intent. His intent was to put that property into the trust also. And the way that we know that is because in the trust document at the back of the trust, Mr. Hegstead had a list, a schedule of assets that he considered to be part of the trust when he created it. And on that list was this property that he didn't title in the name of the trust. So the attorney tells the court, look, we, we know what his intent was. His intent was to make this property part of the trust. We want the court to recognize Mr. Hegstead's intent and give us an order today that says that the property is part of the trust without requiring us to probate it. And guess what? The court granted that petition. So that case set a precedent that now if we know what the intent was and it was a mistake, the court can issue an order putting it into the trust without having to go through probate. But you have to, in order for you to take advantage of this, you have to have the right provisions in the trust. So after this case, after the facts that I just told you, what should every single trust have like that case did? It should have a schedule of assets. It should have a schedule of assets that says what you consider to be part of the trust. We, we go beyond that. Let me see if I can share with you. I'm gonna stop the share here for a second and go back to um, this other document that I have. Let's see if I have that available for you. I don't think I'm gonna be able to pull it up. That's okay, let me just explain it to you. So, so what it is is this. In the trust, I do a statement of intent. And that statement says, look, one of the main purposes of this trust is to avoid probate. And therefore, I consider all of my assets that I own, whether I own them today or acquire them in the future, I intend all of that to be part of my trust. But if I make a mistake, if I inadvertently leave something out at my death, then I want the court to issue an order like they did in that case, the estate of Hegstead, and put everything into the trust without, without going through a probate. So I'm telling the court now, when my, my, my clients trust, all of them say that. So now when my clients make a mistake, I just tell the court, look, this was their intent. Their intent was to avoid probate. We cite the Hegstead case. Boom, the court gives us an order putting it into the trust, avoiding probate. 22 years, many, many clients have made mistakes and we've never had to probate the estate because we have that. And we also have that schedule of assets at the back of the trust. So it's important to do that. But I will tell you, 99% of the trusts that I review don't have a statement. I would say 99.9% .9 don't have a statement of intent of any kind. And most trusts don't have an effective, uh, an effective uh, summary at the end of the trust, a list of assets. The, what they do have is maybe a few things that they owned at the time they did the trust, but this is maybe 10 or 15 years later. Those assets have changed. What we need is a catch-all in that schedule of assets that says not only these things that I've listed above, but anything else I may acquire in the future. It's my intent that that also be part of my trust. Now, whether they had it at the time they did the trust or they acquired it later, if it's left out inadvertently, I can still get everything into the trust without probating, right? So again, a very important feature, saves tens of thousands of dollars if the trust is done correctly, but most people don't have those provisions. So important to do that in trust. Any well, questions? Is, yeah, we've got a few questions on the board for you right now. Um, first question, probate and a short sale, is that possible? Yes, probate and a short sale, sure. Uh, you can do that. Most attorneys, I will tell you, don't want to take those on. But yes, you can do a probate in a short sale. And we do them. I mean, we've done okay, them. good. Um, next I question. How is compensation for the trust 
was removed from the trust unless there is a child involved. Is that true? Say that again. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I was told compensation for the trust was removed from trust unless there is a child involved. You mean the compensation of the trustee? Correct. Well, trustees are entitled to compensation for their services. So, but you have to look at the trust document. What does the trust document say? Most trust documents say they're entitled to reasonable compensation. What's reasonable is going to is going to be different depending on the circumstances, depending on you know if you die today versus 20 years from now, the compensation may have gone up. So compensation is is dependent, but typically it's about one percent of the assets, or maybe a little less, maybe 0.75 basis points of the assets, uh, the trustee's compensation. But uh, the trust can also say that the trustee shall serve without compensation. So you have to look at the trust provisions and to see what that particular trust says. And um, when a family can't find a trust, what can be done? Well, uh, that can be difficult. So it depends on the situation. What I've been able to do in the past is track down the attorney who drafted the trust. Sometimes you can find a copy there. Uh, if you can't find that, you can uh, do a petition with the court and ask the court to recognize that the trust has been lost. Uh, we know there is a trust because there's property titled in the name of the trust. And we ask the court to provide that everything just goes to the children or to the heirs of the decedent. So unfortunately, if someone had done a trust and we're leaving it to specific people uh, and you cannot find that trust, then the only way to deal with it is by going to court and asking the court to recognize that there is a trust and then to give us an order saying that it just goes to the heirs of that deceased person. Still don't have to go through probate if we get that order, but it's not gonna, it may not go the way that the people intended it if the trust provisions are not there. Uh, next question, is there a specific name for a trust to avoid any medical claims? Uh, no, there's, well, we, we attorney call them different things, but remember now, if you're putting your assets in a regular revocable living trust, it's not subject to Medi-Cal anymore, right? So you don't have to do that. But let me let me go let me give you a, a different scenario. So if you if you if you have a trust, if you're getting Medi-Cal benefits and you qualify, no problem. You can continue to get benefits. You can still own your property. You can get benefits. But when you die, if your property's in a trust, no claims. Okay. But let's suppose that somebody's receiving Medi-Cal benefits uh, or they anticipate receiving them soon. And now they wanna sell their property, okay? That is gonna be a problem because while your home is an exempt asset, they don't count it for purposes of determining whether you qualify to receive Medi-Cal if you have a home, no problem. But if you turn that home into cash by selling it, now you've got cash. Now you don't qualify anymore. So what we do is we create an irrevocable trust. Right? So we call it a Medi-Cal Asset Protection Trust. What we do is we create an irrevocable trust and we transfer that property into the trust. That trust now says that it's there for the children when the creators of the trust pass away. But the creators of the trust reserve the right to live there for the rest of their lives. So they have a life estate in the property, uh, but the property no longer belongs to them. Now it belongs to the trust. The trust can then sell the property the money comes into the trust and it can be used for the parents for whatever their needs are. But now uh, <clears throat> they'll still qualify for Medi-Cal. So it has to be done correctly, but that can be done too. So we've got a couple more for you, Paul. Um, can you add two beneficiaries, myself and an additional beneficiary like my son? If I pass, will my son be my only beneficiary? Yes, yes, correct. So during your lifetime, when you create a living trust, you're the sole beneficiary, right? During your lifetime, just like I was when I said I put everything into the trust, it's still mine, I'm the beneficiary. But my trust says that when I pass away, this then goes to my children and they become the beneficiaries. So yes, that's the purpose of the trust. And we've got uh, one from Sharon. If a single man with dementia has owned his home for 40 years plus, and he marries but never adds wife to the deed, However, she takes him to an attorney to have a trust created while the dementia is advanced. Does his, do his children have any rights to the property? Uh, potentially, potentially because 
that if, if the guy does, doesn't have, I mean, just because somebody has dementia or even Alzheimer's doesn't mean that they didn't have the capacity to be able to still sign a will or a trust. There are people who are just forgetful and maybe have onset dementia, but they would still be able to. So all you need to, to be deemed to have capacity to sign a will or a trust, three things. Number one, do you recognize who your relations are, your relatives? Do you recognize your children? Do you recognize your family members? Number two, do you, can you tell me what you own? What are your assets? That you own a house, that you have a bank account, approximately how much do you own? If you can tell me those two things and you can understand and appreciate what a will is or what a trust is, that the effect of it, that you're giving away property at death, if they can understand those concepts, they have capacity. And so people who are elderly, people who have forgetfulness will still be able to pass that kind of a test, but that's the question. Did he have capacity when he signed that trust? Did he know what he was doing? And he may not. And even if he knew what, his, what he was doing, was he unduly influenced by his wife to do that? And so there may be potential claims there. Um, we've got another question from Jose Sanchez with Downtown Realtors. Who pays the attorney in a short sale? So in the probate code, it says that when a, when a property gets sold, the money from the sale of the property gets applied first, first to the cost of administration. Okay. So that's the probate fees. That's the attorney's fee. That's the executor's fee. Second to the cost of sale. Who's that? That's you guys, right? Real estate agents. Third, it goes to pay off the debt. Now, of course, Lenders in a short, short probate sale or short sale situation can say, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to approve this, this short sale. If it's got to go through probate and I got to pay all those fees. No, we're not going to do it. We'll just, we'll just foreclose on the property. So certainly lenders have an out. They can just say, forget it. No, we're not going to pay that. We're not going to go through probate. But if lenders want to do the short sale, then they're going to have to pay some of these fees for the administration because that's the only way it's going to happen. So we often negotiate with these lenders to say, look, we won't take our full fee, but we are going to take 75% or we'll take 60% or whatever the case may be. So you often, we often negotiate the fees with the lenders so that we still get paid. So the money comes from the, from the property itself, from the sale. Okay. Um, next question. How often can you revise a trust? Well, I have clients who are elderly and anytime they get upset with their family or their children, <laughs> Uh, they're calling me, you know, I have clients who call me at least probably once every six months to make changes to their trust. You Got it. As often as you want. It's really up to, uh, up to the client. All right. I think this might be the last question, Paul. Um, what is the California rule for contesting a trust slash will? And is the verbiage still included in the trust? Yeah. So people can contest a trust uh, on a number of things. The most common is lack of capacity, as I mentioned earlier, that at the time somebody signed this, they didn't know what they were signing. Uh, that's number one, but that has to be proven because the presumption, when somebody signs a trust, the presumption is that it's valid and the contestant has to prove otherwise, that it's not valid. So you have to prove that they lack capacity. Uh, the other thing is, is undue influence, that somebody uh, unduly influenced the person. They were, they were elderly, they were susceptible to the influence. Maybe they didn't have capacity, but they were really susceptible to the influence of this other person who said, uh, I'm the one that takes care of you. Uh, your children don't come around anymore. Leave it all to me. And then takes them to the attorney, finds the attorney. They're there with the attorney when they uh, making calls to the attorney. They're there when the client signs the documents. So they're there in all the meetings. All of that has the indicia of of undue influence, that somebody else is really pushing this person to do that. So, so that's uh, something that can also be shown or proven or fraud or, um, you know, so any number of claims can be made to contest a trust. And in most trusts, in all of my trusts, I include what's called a no contest clause. A no contest clause is basically to say, look, this is what I want. I've, pro I've provided my trust the way that I want to. And if you contest, I'll tell you, I'm going right now, I'm going with the brother and sister. Um, I, I would have re represented the parents and I did their estate plan. And so the, the sister or the, the daughter of, of my clients had really upset her parents because they, she was basically stealing from them. 
and they found out about it. She was take, she was still using their credit card, and they were elderly, and they depended on her uh, to handle their finances, and she was stealing from them. And so when they found out about it, they got really upset, and they changed the trust. They left her, uh, I believe it was 25%, and so 75% is going to her brother. And so now, the, both parents have passed away, and now she's considering, she's got an attorney, whether to contest the trust, claiming that her mom didn't have capacity at the time the trust was signed. So they're, they're, they're threatening that, but the problem is that if they, if they follow through with that and they lose because the court determines, no, mom did have capacity, then she's lose, she'll lose her inheritance because the trust says if you contest, you, you get nothing. So now she has to make a choice. Do I stick with the 25% or do I roll the dice and try and go for my half? So we'll see what happens, but we're just in the beginning of that case. Well, thank you, Paul. Really appreciate you coming on and joining us today. Uh, thank you for following up. And um, if anybody needs Paul's uh, information, we'll post it in the chat right now, but I'm not sure if you could put it up on your, uh, on your slide. Yeah, Paul. we do that. That way everybody can take it down. Um, thank you again for joining us. You're always great. You've got a wealth of knowledge. And, and every time I take your class, Paul, I, I, I learn something new. So that's, that's great. Um, Excellent. Excellent. I'm happy to. I'd like to introduce Jorge Mesa with uh, Pacific Coast Title. He's going to give the title tip of the week. I am tired of talking about the same thing over and over and over. So I'm going to record it so I can play it. Uh, but absentee owners, guys, that's the farming that you want to target. Next week, I promise you, I can show you a way. Please join me. And it's, uh, it's easy. If after 10 minutes you don't see a volume, just disconnect. I'm gonna show you how to pick up a few listings. There's a simple equation, a simple number that is based on touches. I'm gonna show you four different touches for you guys to pick up a few listings. I do that training and every time that I do that training, uh, it's so easy, so simple to understand that people, they get excited. The problem is to do the follow-up. So if you're willing to do that follow-up, to do the, the hard work after you take that training, I can guarantee you, you will pick up some listings. So I'm going to show you how to get your absentee owners and how to target those absentee owners on this COVID-19 uh, new way to do business. So please, please, please join us next week. Anthony? Eddie? That's it, guys. That's a wrap. Thank you, everybody, for joining well, us. Hold and on, we'll hold see on, you hold next on, hold week. On. Hold on, Javier Munoz, okay. the term my guy. Thank you, guys. I know they probably wonder why every week does this gentleman, term my guy, talks because I'm, I'm able to provide you guys, uh, you, uh, you guys with uh, some flyers and tools that you need for your marketing. So please um, give us a call at 401 5000, 401 5000 for all your term my needs. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Can all the title reps? Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. See you next week. Can the title reps from Pacific Coast title stay on the call, please? Of course. So I don't need to send a text. <laughs> Bye, Thank you, guys. Paul. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Just give a few minutes uh, so we don't need to do another call or anything like that. I want to run something by you guys. Sorry guys, I'm putting some people in the waiting room. Tony, can you stop the recording? <laughs>